knows how to get it done, and the bulk of his driving has been with Lamborghini. Yeah, and he's run with uh, Andrea Caldarelli before with the uh, Triple F team, so they're familiar with one another. As Andrea said, we speak the same language, and that can certainly be beneficial when you're trying to really fine-tune a race car over the course of the weekend. So I think the chemistry is pretty much immediate. I spoke to Tommy Sadler, who's kind of the uh, crew chief there at Apex racing. I said, how's he fitting in? He said, well, he doesn't have the feet up on the kitchen sink yet or uh, uh, leaving the toilet seat up, but um, he's, uh, he'll fit in quickly. <laughs> sort of tongue-in-cheek there from Tommy talking about how drivers suddenly uh, get comfortable very, very quickly with their group. Shouldn't take long. Apex right. has such a great history of integrating drivers of great talent uh, over the course of the years. And, and they might not have previous experience with the team, but they slot right in right away. This is Steven Agakani. He and his co-driver, Laura Spinelli, were very impressive at Sonoma, with Spinelli actually sitting on the overall pole for race two in Sonoma the first time out, and Spinelli was rapid yesterday in practice, too. Yeah, a bit of a head-scratcher there yesterday. For example, right now, Beretta has the fast time at 134.0, obviously on fresh tires. Cool, uh, coolish part of the day right now, early here, but yesterday, uh, Spinelli in the heat of the afternoon, 33-1, which was a second and a half clear of the rest of the competition. Now, admittedly, some of that can be running with stickers versus, uh, you know, well-worn Pirelli tires. But nonetheless, uh, the Mercedes here has been very, very quick after a great start, as you said, at Sonoma with the podium finish in race one. Had the pole and led comfortably uh, in race two until they had a bit of an issue with the wheel during their pit stop exchange. But certainly a team that's uh, burst on the scene with the media effect in terms of their performance. Yes, Race Tronics is the name of the team. Stephen Agakani, second fastest lap so far, with 134.6, a gap of six tenths of a second to Beretta. That is Laura Spinelli, we were taking a look at a moment ago. Another rapid Italian GT driver, and we'll see him take over here in uh, just over 10 minutes for Q2. Yeah, and he's got a bit of an advantage because he's running uh, the Super Trofeo Series this weekend, as is Ashton Harrison, who's uh, on board the 93 car in this uh, session for Race's Edge. So good to come for a new circuit and get double the track time, essentially. Helps with the learning curve, but obviously a big adjustment between one of the Lamborghini uh, Super Trofeo machines and uh, this GT3 platform. This is David Askew, who right now is the 11th fastest driver, 7th in Pro-Am, DXDT Racing is the team. Didn't get much running in in race one of the season in Sonoma with uh, an incident fairly early that caused them not to finish that race. But uh, he and Dirk Muller, I think, could be a really interesting pairing over the course of the season in Pro-Am. Yeah, I spoke to David yesterday, and he's very pumped up. I mean, he loved running with Ryan Dial, but he said the change has been good. He said Dirk is obviously up on the wheel immediately, very analytical, and he's pushing me. Uh, you tend to get a little bit comfortable with your teammates over the course of uh, several years together, and he said this is a new challenge. He said... Uh, I feel the team is in much better shape this year, not running so many cars, a bit more focused. He said, and he was quite brutally honest about himself and his performance. He said, I've got to stop making the big mistakes. He said, I'm getting there in terms of speed, but he said, it's the big mistakes that are hurting us right now. So he said, I can't really put my finger on why it's happening. I asked him if it's focus or whatever. He said, I'm not really sure. He said, but both Stefan Pfeiffer, who's the uh, engineer there and uh, kind of leading the charge along with Dirk are really working hard on me. And they're one of the few teams that actually got to come and test here with the late change of uh, schedule coming to this racetrack. They got a couple of days testing here, here a week or so ago. Thanks, man. In Pro-Am is Chandler Hull, Bimmer World, the team. Bill Oberlin, the co-driver. I think this could be a really fun pairing to keep an eye on over the course of the season. And Chandler Hull, a young man who does not have a lengthy resume in sports car racing, but he's packed a lot into a short amount of time, and he's putting that experience to good use with the fastest time in Pro-Am, currently fourth overall. Yeah, it seemed like if there was a race anywhere globally, uh, Chandler was in it, right, <laughs> last year. This year, more focused. They're really determined to focus on this championship, this seven-race program, do a bunch of testing. They haven't done it yet, but they've got a lot of uh, testing scheduled at a couple of racetracks before even the, ne the next round that we'll see at the IR. So uh, he's loving life with Bill Orbel, and he said he just, he just tells you the way it is. He said, do this, and you'll be quick, and that's proving to be correct. So I think he's a great sounding board, and I think with Bill, it's so uh, established in his career he's a veteran I mean one of the winningest drivers in the GT formulas here globally and in North America that when you listen to Bill you, you know he's telling you the truth and he's all about winning uh, and I think he can bring that uh, psychology to Chandler uh, I think they're going to be very strong and I'm really impressed with Bill starting up to his GT3 
Eureka and had a really strong run at Sonoma. And they're quietly confident here this weekend. I see Bill and Chandler smiling when I ask them, how's the car working? And they said, yeah, it's pretty damn good. It's a great point, too, because they are stalwarts in GT4 racing. They've done touring car racing over the years. But this is a big step to GT3. And talking to some of those teams that have made that adjustment in recent years, they talk about just the level of complexity in a GT3 car relative to anything else on the GT ladder. Yeah, and I think that's what's important with so many of these manufacturers is the great customer support program that they have. You got Dan Lubin here on a regular basis for BMW, Motorsport here in North America, along with uh, all of his technicians and engineers. They're there down in pit lane, helping these teams get up to speed with this new machinery. So much of it is plugging a laptop, right, and try and sort things out, but they are there on the spot, and that's really uh, helping these teams get up to speed very, very quickly. Back on board with Stephen Agucani, US Racetronics, the Mercedes AMG GT3 Evo. Now we take a look at Misha Goik currently third fastest the Canadian driver coming through the S's and this is an interesting part of the track if you're going to catch traffic we were touring the track as I said yesterday and there's not a ton of room offline and the marbling here especially with the support series that are on site with uh, Lamborghini Super Trofeo it is extreme well, there's been some resurfacing here, but there's also been a lot of grinding, and that makes this uh, surface, uh, gives it plenty of grip, but also it'll kind of shred the tires a little bit. So yes, if you run offline through these high-speed S's, and you can see the car's really jockeying around through there. It's very technical, uh, you know, you can hit the bumps a little bit differently, so it's very challenging. The driver has to be up on the wheel all of the time. Goikberg's best time, 135.258. That is 1.1 seconds off of his teammate. Kaylee Beretta, who currently holds the top spot, currently third in the pro class as well. Very tight, though, between Goikberg and uh, Michael Dine, and Dynan's only a tenth off of him, so it's a big battle there for P3 in class. Jason Harward, who's got a smile on his face in that picture, but quite frankly, when we <laughs> spoke to him this weekend, he's not been loving his time here. I think he's just struggling to get his head wrapped around the track a little bit. Zalus Motorsports, still a very new team. Love the paint speed on that race car, but uh, still trying to find a little bit of speed. Where does he stand right now? Currently eighth in Pro-Am, 13th overall. Yeah, he seemed kind of frustrated. He said, yeah, I'm really not loving life today, and he was hot and sweaty getting out of the car. He's a super fit guy, but, um, and I think sometimes you come to a new racetrack, it's, there's a lot going on here. And, uh, you know, with his experience, sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. I'm sure just to sit down and a debrief with the engineer and his co-driver, will have settled him down a little bit. And so, well, you see, really sideways there. He, he tries to tighten up his hands a little bit to get around the 61 car of uh, Sada there. But, um, yeah, sometimes you just need to sleep on it. Yeah, I mean, literally going to bed, getting up the next morning, have a reset, fresh day, new set of tires. Track's going to feel pretty good here. And I hate to call it cool because it's not cool outside, but the cooler part of the day, let's put it that way. Yeah, relative to what we saw in the afternoon yesterday and what we're expecting today, not just high temperatures, but high humidity too. And I was talking to Greg Leofuz, who's racing in Pirelli GT4 America this weekend. He said their air conditioning isn't working. They don't have the parts here to fix it, so they're going to have to deal with it. And they're seeing cockpit temperatures in that GT4 BMW of 140 degrees. Yeah, it's it's uh, immense, and uh, just the humidity here and. I also spoke to the DXDT team, and they've taken out their AC systems and running just a blower system to uh, save a little bit of weight. So uh, these teams and drivers are really going to be up against it here this weekend for the crew standing on pit lane in that heat is one thing, but inside that cockpit, it's going to be a long 40 to 50 minute stint here this afternoon and tomorrow. But there is a threat of rain, so that may ease the uh, pace a little bit and cool things down a touch. Inside the final three minutes of Q1, Beretta the fastest but is in the pit lane right now. You can tell who's in the pit lane, by the way, if you look at the graphics on the left-hand side of the screen. If the name is highlighted in red, that means they're currently in the pits, and I suspect that means they feel like they've gotten the most out of their car. Still out on track, though. Second fastest, Stephen Akakani, who went a little bit quicker actually here recently and was able to get within a half a second now mm -hmm. of Beretta. Goikberg still out on track, too. One of the question marks for these teams has been tire wear here. Most have not tested, and most have not done long runs. Pretty much everyone I talked to said, yeah, we did five, six laps, came in, made an adjustment, went back out. So they are not sure what kind of tire wear they're going to see here. Keep in mind also, this is a new Pirelli tire for 2022, which most teams don't have a whole ton of data on 
at all just to begin with. So no baseline, plus not much experience here. Yeah, and I think what we're seeing now, kind of the times have plateaued a little bit. So I think you kind of lose that sweet spot after about four or five laps. But talking to teams from Thursday practice day to yesterday and the official practices, it seemed like the track was rubbering in a little bit. They weren't getting the same amount of tire deck. Also, they're getting the balance in the race car a little bit better. If you've got an imbalance, say the car's understeering and you're really overworking the front tires, obviously, as you get deeper into a run, they're going to get worse and worse. You get the car dialed in so it's got a better balance. You don't over uh, extend the, uh, the tire usage on the front or the rear of the car, depending on whether you have understeer or oversteer in the car. One minute left in Q1. McKaylee Beretta, the quickest, down now to the pit lane at Amanda. Well, Laura Spinelli was able to take the pole in Sonoma in the opening weekend for this team. And, Laura, I talked to you yesterday about how you and Steven both enjoy the same setup combination in the car. What benefit does that add as a duo? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure we are a strong team, each other. Uh, we are in the right uh, direction here. Um, we struggle a little bit in Sonoma. But uh, here we find the, the right setup. So actually, Steven is running P2, so it's really, really good. And uh, we will try to, to get the first throw even for the Q2. So we try to send it. You're pulling double duty here, racing in the support series of the Lamborghini Super Trofeo as well. How are you managing that with the heat here, the weather, and the changing between classes? Yeah, uh, especially here, it's a bit tough because it's really warm. Uh, I know both cars very well, so uh, it's easy for me to adapt uh, in uh, every condition, every style of the, of the car, so I'm really happy. I'm fast in both categories, so we will try to, to do a lot of podium this week. Well, Cal, I can confirm on the humidity down here, so I think the key <laughs> is to stay hydrated. No shortage of confidence in that young man, and his resume backs that up. Yeah, I think sometimes the language kind of makes it sound a little aggressive in terms of how confident he is. But nonetheless, I've been very impressed with him. And uh, I think they got a great team, great driver combination. Uh, Steven's done an excellent job. Uh, what was he, 12 years old when he first got yeah. GT3 experience or something, just in a, in a test day and track days. But um, a lot of experience for on his young shoulders right now. Did a really nice job there, just four tenths off the fast time by Beretta. I tell you, he was impressive again as Ashton Harrison, yes. uh, fifth overall, first in Pro-Am and about 1.4 seconds or 1.3 seconds off the fastest time of this morning. So uh, she'll lead the charge in Pro-Am, Chandler Hull second, Smithson third. So a good little battle there in Pro-Am. Yeah, really remarkable lap there from Ashton Harrison as the checkered flag has come out. Pretty much everyone is in the pits. I don't think anyone's on a flyer. So the results or the standings as you see them, I think are what we can expect. Looks like George Kurtz is still out on the track. He's fourth right now, ninth overall, so seeing if he can uh, dig deep and find a little bit more. That pole, though, provisional pole, we should say, in Pro-Am for Ashton Harris, it looks like she snagged it by six thousandths of a second over Chandler Hall. Yeah, that's uh, that's impressive. I've uh, been really impressed with watching her this year. Um, obviously, as a tunnel of the Super Trofeo experience, but this is a whole different weapon. And I asked her yesterday specifically about jumping between the two cars. You have the advantage of more track time, but she said it's very different. I mean, these GT3 cars just have a ton of downforce, so how you attack the corners is very, very different. Well, there you have it. k packs on top. They have their third consecutive pull to start the season with the Kelly Beretta now paired with Andrea Caldarelli. Steven Agacani, Laura Spinelli, second, Michigoik Berg was the third fastest. Michael Dynan rounds out the pro class cars. Ashton Harrison looks like will be on the pro amp pole, just narrowly ahead of Chandler Hull. But how about Scott Smithson? He was so impressive in St. Pete in GT America, powered by AWS, but definitely his best showing so far in his young GT World Challenge America career. Yeah, and I think that state sets the stage nicely for Brian Sellers. I think they had a lot more pace than they really showed in terms of outright results at Sonoma, but GT3 cars we know sometimes on certain tracks are quite difficult to follow. We're expecting a bit of the same today unless we get, see some uh, severe tire degradation. So this qualifying session was very, very important for setting the table for this afternoon and potentially the result you'll end up with. And you saw Charlie Scardina, impressive once again, qualifying right in the middle of the Pro-Ams as an M-Class entry. Yeah, he, he has a lot of pace and that's a cool little team, so uh, Triazzi Racing. Surprising to see real-time racing down in 16th. I know they've been battling some handling issues. They only turned six laps in practice two yesterday, and all I was able to ascertain is that they had a problem. Uh, we're still trying to diagnose it. Last time I checked in with them, this is the real-time Acura 
Aaron Vogel down in 16th. We'll see Michael Cooper take over here for Q2 in just a few moments. But great to have them back at the championship after a few years away. I know they have high expectations for this driver lineup, which remains intact from a year ago, just with a different team. Yeah, it's... Um it's early days, you know, talking to Michael last night, I believe it was a fuel pump or fuel pressure issue they struggled with yesterday, caused a bit of a misfire with the machine. So lost valuable track time. That's exactly what they don't need to have happen because they're on the back foot a little bit just to really try to find the sweet spot with the setup on that car. Jim Bell is the engineer and working very hard. And uh, Michael said the car, quite honestly, is a bit edgy right now. And he said if it's edgy for me, Aaron's not going to like it. So they've really got to try and find a more comfortable uh, position with the setup on that race car they got some testing coming up but um elected not to come here they thought the racetrack wouldn't be that difficult to uh, find a setup for but it's proven to be quite the opposite so uh, they're on the back foot a little bit this weekend they just need to get out there get deeper into the season we'll see some results from that team i mean both aaron and Michael did a really solid job last year aboard the mercedes and i think they believe that this acura is going to have the potential to win races this year Paul sitters in pro-am for race one racers edge motorsports and amanda is there well, Ryan, I made my way over here to find Ashton Harrison, and she's already run off to get ready for the Lamborghini uh, support after this. But, John Maraki, I heard that she jumped out of the car and said, I have no idea how I did that. What has impressed you about Ashton? Uh, well, in a word, her talent. I mean, she's amazingly talented. She's really on a path to success, and it's, um, it's really nice to work with her. She's got such a great positive attitude. She's very humble. Um, and she tends to doubt herself, but she's got tremendous talent. Well, Mario is pretty great at pulling out these poles as well. Do you think you guys will start pole and pole race one and two here at NOLA Motorsports Park? Well, that's the hope. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But yeah, we feel like we have a really good car. We have two really good drivers, so we certainly have a chance for pole and pole. Good luck. It's a good little team out of Florida, Racers mm. Edge Motorsports. They've been around the game for quite a while, and they have stumbled into something special with this Acura, and they've got a great we go. Look at this. relationship <laughs> with... Calderelli and Pepper already at it. Yeah, with... Leaving with the lane. yeah. Let's talk about K-Pax here, because, uh, yeah, these are the two drivers that won the championship last year, won basically every race, I think all but three or four a year ago, Calderelli and Pepper. Now they're split up, and they are trying to find a little bit of room around one another, and the bragging rights between the two. Yeah, I think that's going to be a big point of discussion under the K-Pax 10. Who comes out with pole here in Q2 between the two champs? Yes, well, the two cars will line up uh, in the same column, first and third, with uh, the runs by Beretta and Goikberg in that first session. But Calderelli wanted that clean air, wants to get out there, lay down a lap. He said in his interview to Amanda that maybe we don't have the, the best car here this weekend. So it uh, may not just be all about Calderelli and Pepper. There are other teams, drivers, particularly Spinelli with that fast lap from yesterday and with the number six Mercedes from US uh, Racetronics uh, entry. Can he spoil the party a little bit for K-Pax here this weekend? And keep in mind, by regulation, the driver you saw in Q1 in these Pro-Am lineups was the amateur, the less experienced driver. Now we have the pros in the Pro-Am cars, and these cars are BOP'd exactly the same. The Pro-Class Lamborghini is the same as a Pro-Am Lamborghini, and therefore, if you've got the right driver and the right team on the right day, it's by no means out of the equation that we could have pro winners up towards the very top of the chart. Well, that's the exciting part, as stacked as these lineups are, and with the uh, solid AM drivers in the lineup, just keep it close uh, and let your pro jump on board. And you know, sometimes you have to, drivers tend to forget about the big picture of a championship. They want that overall position, so you see some great battles when it really doesn't count for anything in terms of points scored between maybe a pro class entry and a pro AM, but. Drivers are drivers. They, they want to be anyone who's in front of them. Early part of this lap, Cal, can you talk us through what Jordan is dealing with as he makes his way around NOLA? Well, it's, uh, it's a new track for him, obviously, but he's experienced that a lot over the last uh, 18 months or so coming to North American soil. He's a fast learner. He's a great racer, I think, in terms of one lap speed. He may even have the edge on Calderelli, but Calderelli has the experience and the racecraft to uh, really recognize key moments in a race and get the results behind him. But here we come through turn five. You can see that use that curbing a little bit through there. And then you're really setting up through six and seven for the big run down through the S's. But for him right now, the tires, you know, the heat of the day, they're probably getting in their sweet spot. I'm not sure if this will be the uh, the quick lap or the following one. I would say laps three and four are probably going to be as fast as you're going to get. Obviously, the fuel load burns off a little bit, which means the car gets a little bit lighter. But right now, you're just trying to generate 
A little bit more tire temperature than you get from the ovens, uh, from the heated blankets. All of these tires are allowed to be warmed up before they even go onto the car. And there you see it immediately in traffic. Did that hurt him too bad? That's turn 15. This is 16. Final one on the front straightaway. This reminds me of Portland kind of exiting off that final corner there onto that long front stretch. Let's see who's going to have the edge here in kind of the opening salvo. First flying laps of Q2. Calderelli a 38-1. Pepper a 30 make that a 33-8, excuse me, and then uh, Pepper goes to a 33-8, uh, Brown a 33-8, Oberlin 34-2, so Calderelli quite a ways down. Yeah, it was a 38-1, so he was compromised somewhere yeah, on he, that lap. Oh, yeah, Spinelli just put up a 32-5. There we go. Wow. That's kind of the delta and advantage that he had yesterday, so that car and he seem to be in a different league this weekend, and we'll have to see if Pepper and company can uh, find anything in their mix. Keep in mind, new tires for driver two here in Q2, but the fuel load is the same, or, or you start with, with one fuel load, you can't add more fuel between Correct. Q1 and Q2, so there should be a chance that uh, with the cars burning off some of that fuel load here in Q2, that the speeds will increase, the times will go down deeper into this session, even relative to what we saw in Q1. So Spinelli, Pepper, Brown, the top three, and right there you've got the top Pro-Am car in third overall. There is Spinelli. Let's see how he attacks this racetrack. These are the high-speed S's. Turn eight, you turn through the right-hand sweeper. It's 10, 11, out of here, a little sort of straight away there, but you're running so close, tough to make a move inside there. Traffic up ahead will not ruin his next lap. Looks like a compromise, and we'll see. Here comes Pepper He's to He's on a good one. He's on a good one. Pepper. He had purple sector one and two, but I don't see him really leaping up the charts here. No, he didn't have a great third sector, it looks like. Yeah, not surprising. Fastest of anyone through uh, sector one and two, and I thought that was going to be potentially a front row, at least maybe the pole lap, but he sits in fourth. Calderelli made a big jump, though, ahead of his teammate Pepper to get up to third. That's up 13 spots after the compromised first lap we saw from him. Well, we talk about the Calderelli-Pepper battle, but Altoy, who was part of the KPEX yes. squad at Sonoma, is now uh, aboard the number nine machine. And uh, he runs second overall in pro leading uh, the Pro-Am class, so uh, let's not count him out. Yeah, Jacques Mo back with TR3, back with Ziad Gondor, who he raced with last year. Mario Farnbacher was third a moment ago, but then got bumped down to fourth because Brian Sellers has put in a big lap. He's now third overall and second in Pro-Am. Well, certainly the Mercedes is quick, so they'll be looking at that time by Spinelli, thinking we can get close to that, but Altoy is absolutely wringing the neck on this Lamborghini as he exits the final corner on the front straightaway. To the timing line with 8 minutes 45 seconds left in the session. And in a 133.5, so that's about a tenth or two off of what he had done previously. Yeah, and that makes me think, you know, I think there's a little bit of a fall off in terms of performance. You really need a hitter early in this session. We saw a lot of teams abandon the runs early in that 15 minute session and uh, a little bit earlier. So I think lap 3-4 is kind of the prime time, and uh, I wonder what happened to Jordan Pepper there, because he is now all the way down in seventh with that third sector that was not matching his performance in sector one and two. So that could be a bit of a disaster for that team and that group looking for a result here this weekend. This is Dirk Muller, newcomer to the DXDT. No, it's not. Excuse me, that's Brian Sellers, the other DXDT racing car. Mario Farnbacher here. This is the car Ashton Harrison put on the Pro-Am pole. In Q1, just a few moments ago, Farnbacher right now fourth in Pro-Am. What kind of lap does he have going? Well, it's four tenths between first and fourth, but Mario sits in in class right there. Just did a 33. Yeah, just eight. a little bit off as what we saw from Altoe, kind of dropping a tenth or two on that fourth lap. It's amazingly close, especially in Pro-Am. Farnbacher is 19 thousandths off of Brown for third. It's two thousandths between Calderelli and Farnbacher. That's Pro and Pro-Am mixed together. So the second fastest Pro entry, Calvin, all the way down in sixth right now. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, we talked about the Calderelli, Calderelli Pepper battle. They six, six and seventh overall now. And that's just indicative of how competitive this class is this year. 
Halfway through Q2, provisionally on the pole in the AM class is this car. It's Onofrio Triarci. Charlie Scardina scored the AM pole for race one just a few moments ago. And now to Robbie Foley, who is driving this Liquid Molly sponsored tournament sport BMW with 644 on the clock. Let's check in once again in the pit lane with Amanda. Well, it will be a P3 start for Scott Smithson here in race number one at Nola Motorsports Park. And Scott, I talked to you yesterday about your Sonoma experience and you summarize it with a word that I cannot say on television. When you put that behind you, what was your focus coming into this weekend? I think it was a lot of car stuff. Um, we just really were chasing uh, the car in Sonoma and probably made some, you know, too big of changes. So we just, we went into it just trying to stay within the window a little bit better with the car. And yesterday, by the end of the day, <clears throat> car felt good, and, and we came out this morning, and, and it, you know I feel good. Um, track, track had a lot of grip, um, so uh, you know, and in my lap, I feel like I've got more time to made some mistakes, and um, so yeah. Looks like the Mercedes is taking well to this track. Where do you feel that the Mercedes is, has the advantage? I, I think really it's like using all the curbing and stuff. Um, it, it's really good in the curbing. The S's, I feel it's really strong. Um, so, I mean, we'll see though. I, it's, uh, I'm happy with a P3, but the race is always different, right? Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, and by using the curbing, it's really about the compliance of the suspension. Mercedes has always been good that way. And I think when you, uh, not just the curves, but also the bumps as you're coming through those high speed S's, it hangs on. Talking to Brian Sellers, when he experienced the Mercedes in testing in the off season the first time, he said, you know, you can really kind of overdrive the car and it just hangs in there. And so for the AM driving partner as well, that's really a nice comfort zone to have. And that car has long had the reputation of being the most amateur friendly, I think you would say, GT3 car. There have been a few others that with some Evo packages might have entered into that conversation with the Acura coming to mind among others. But from the get-go, that Mercedes AMG GT3 and then with its subsequent Evo package has always been one that has been a bit more on the forgiving side, I think it's safe to say. Corey Lewis piloting this Lamborghini. It's Zalus Motorsports, the team this year for Jeff Burton, new co-driver, new team. And Corey right now, a little bit further down than he'd like to be, eighth in Pro-Am, 12th overall. Yeah, and he has a ton of experience with this Lamborghini. He ran with the K-Pac squad in this championship last year. He's run in other championships in North America alongside Brian Sellers and some of the big endurance events with a ton of success. So he brings an extreme amount of knowledge uh, to the table. And I think that's really going to rate Jeff and this team kind of take it to the next level. Oh, <laughs> sideways there coming off that final corner. That was cool. Most of the front runners have made their way to the pit lane. Alto A is out on track, but has not improved for his first two sectors. Andrea Caldarelli had a green first sector, which means personal best, but yellow in sector two, so did not improve there. He's all the way down in sixth overall right now. Might be one to keep an eye on. Colin Brown, who was up among the front runners early in the session. He is fourth right now. And the three sectors in terms of who has the fastest uh, sector time split between Altoe, sector one, you got Brian Sellers fastest in sector two, and Colin Brown in sector three. So uh, Mercedes uh, getting it done in a couple of the sectors here. So even though Spinelli has that de demonic time, seven tenths uh, clear of the field, he's not been outright fastest in any of the sectors uh, here this morning but good over the, the overall lap. So some of that is just piecing it together. It's a, it's a complex lap, it's very technical, so seems like he's got some challenges in terms of speed potential, but he's the one who nailed the lap and put it all together. On board with Jan Halen, Wright Motorsports, the team. This is gonna be interesting. So the team that swept the Pro-Am class at Sonoma sits seventh. Yeah. It's amazing how mixed up and jumbled the grid would be, should this all hold, Ryan Dial just jumped up a couple of the spots in his Triarci entry, that Ferrari now up to 12th, 8th though in Pro-Am, but you look at this, top car is a pro, then you have one, two, three, four Pro-Ams, then three more pros, then you get back to more Pro-Am entries all the way down to 13th overall, I mean it's totally jumbled up, so 
race two tomorrow should be fascinating, and that's even before you factor <laughs> in the rain that's in the forecast. Yeah, it's going to be a wild one. I, I love the look of this grid. I mean, I am so excited just looking at how, you know, from the norm where we've seen the Capex team dominate over the last couple of years to see their cars, they're not going to be happy about it, but I love it because... Uh, we know they're going to dig deep. They're always great with the strategy in terms of when to make that pit stop and executing the pit stop to perfection. But they have some work to do. A lot of challenges here this weekend as we look at Charlie Luck. What an exciting weekend it was for him to team with his uh, new son-in-law and Jan Halen and uh, sweep the weekend. And he is not intimidated. I mean, uh, you know, stepping up to the Pro-Am class last year after having a great season in GT America the year before. Um, he's out there with some of the big boys, and he just doesn't give an inch. Yeah, exactly so. And, and that's after a really lengthy hiatus in his racing career. He did a lot of stock car racing in the 80s, was out of the game for decades, and got back into single-make Porsche racing for a time, jumped into the GT3 car for the first time with GT America one year ago, won that championship, not just in the Masters class, which he was eligible for, but overall as well. And now, taking that next step forward, and it seems like he has been ready for the challenge at each step. Yeah, DL went out a little bit later than some of the other drivers. He keeps improving his times, which is quite impressive. He just went quicker than his previous best on his fourth lap of this session. So that may be a good indicator for this Ferrari in terms of might not be having the outright one lap pace, but maybe a little bit stronger on the uh, longer run. And by the way, we talked about the track record and the potential that it could fall, and it looks like that will be the case. The previous track record set in an F3 car earlier this year of 133.5. Well, Laura Spinelli went a full second faster than that. And you might be wondering, well, didn't IndyCar race here? And yes, they did, but it was a slightly different layout. They didn't use the full S's. So as far as this layout is concerned, that lap from Spinelli is the fastest ever turned in an official session. Uh, pretty our remarkable. Rental, our rental car lap. <laughs> well, Brian, we had Brian, Brian Till, Till driving. The right. That always helps. Just think how fast it could have been. Mm, if Someone you, else. If you were driving. Uh, well, you're the Indy winner in uh, the group. There is so. that. Yeah. Of course, Amanda is the Skip Barber Racing School graduate. She's and been she impressive. Is, she's had the rental yeah. car chores this weekend. Very impressive. And she's standing by with Charlie Luck right now as the checkered flag flies. You know, we make a, a great trifecta. We got Ryan backseat driving. Cal, you're giving me directions. We've made it to work on time, so I think we're a good duo. Another great duo here this weekend, Jan Halen and Charlie Luck. But it seems like you guys might be chasing some things on the car. What's the issue? Yeah, Amanda, I think um, first off, we did not come here and test. And I'd say this has been our most difficult setup to move from, I would say, a not so good setup to a better one. We are learning every time we go out, making adjustments every time we go out. Um, and I think uh, I had a much quicker lap. I messed up turn 13. I think I would have been half a second at least quicker. But anyway, um, now we're in race mode. And race mode is concentration, consistency, and, and hitting your marks. So, yeah, we're still learning, and um, we're definitely going to be on the hunt. Well, on a positive note, you did sweep Sonoma with your son-in-law. How did you guys celebrate that success? Yeah, I think it, um, I don't think neither Jan nor I kind of got the emotional relationship connection until after it was over. It was like we had together done something super sweet that none of us had ever done before. And it was really, really, really special. And um, gosh, the family was blown up about it in a great way. And so um, Jan's folks are over in Belgium and they're watching him. I've family in Virginia. So it was really, really special. Awesome job. Still some work to be done, though, here today with qualifying results that probably weren't what they were hoping for. Jan Halen in that session, surprisingly, all the way down in 12th overall. Here are the results from Q2. Loris Spinelli, his second consecutive pole for races that he's had a chance to qualify for. Yeah, and look at that. He's got a buffer of four pro-amp cars. I mean, that can certainly change when you get the amp driver in the mix and maybe some of those pro cars, even if they sort of run the first half of the race back in the positions they qualified in will move up. But even so, that's great news for him. How about this for Giacomo Alto? He's taken out of the K-Pax lineup, <laughs> sent to TR3, and not bad for the young Italian and the, the upstart TR3 team that doesn't quite have the same history as K-Pax, but they've proven they are extremely capable with these Lamborghinis. They really are. I, I'd love to know from Jordan Pepper what went wrong at the end of that lap. So I know it was earlier in the session and maybe those uh, fast sector times went away to other drivers, but he had a great lap going, couldn't quite nail it. I got, think he's got potential. I think he could have qualified certainly top three and a little bit closer to, to uh, 
Altoe potentially. Looking a little further down, a sweep of the M-Class poles for Triarci Competizioni with an Ofrio Triarci backing up what his brother-in-law, uh, Charlie Scardina, did in the first qualifying session of the weekend, and that's big for them. There's only the two cars in the M-Class. A, of course, has swept the weekend in Sonoma, but a sweep of the pole positions, at least, for Triarci here in NOLA. That was fun. We've got two more races for Fanatec GT still to come here this weekend. Hope you joined us for them. But for now, so long from the Big Easy.